Welcome, welcome. My name is Lily Weinberg and welcome to episode 19 of Coast to Coast. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar, we started the show Coast to Coast right as the pandemic occurred um, more than five months ago, it's hard to believe. Um, and what we're doing here is we are looking at the future of cities during this really dynamic time. How are cities responding um, to this moment in time? And we've examined all sorts of topics um, from public spaces to smart city solutions to mobility. And we're really thinking around how equity um, in particular plays a role in this work. Um, last week, we looked at how to measure social impact and make tough decisions during a time of budget constraints. And most importantly, we really want our audience, all of you, to leave with practical solutions for your cities. So today, I'm really excited to talk about how universities are grappling with COVID and the major decisions that they're dealing with during this time. In particular, we'll look at how cities, especially ones dependent on economic benefits of these universities and how they're dealing with the pandemic. What are some creative solutions that universities and cities can explore together? So I wanna welcome Omar Blake, the CEO and co-founder of U3 Advisors. Hi, Omar. How are you? Hi, Lily. I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. And where are you located? I am located in Philadelphia. Philadelphia. And, and I know um, we've had Catherine Ott Level on our show. Um, they've done an extraordinary job of really keeping their public spaces open, too. They did. They did. Very much so. And Philadelphia, so far, we are, uh, we are doing very well, at least in uh, mitigating some of the impact. That's right. That's right. Okay. So I'm really excited to talk about universities and cities. Um, you in particular are um, extraordinarily qualified to, to talk about this, this subject um, as part of U3 Advisors. You're a firm, it's, a, it's a firm that's really working with anchor institutions to advance their missions and unlock their impact. And, um, and, and like I said, you're uniquely suited to speak on this topic with your experience in advising universities and cities and creating long-term economic strategies. I um, mean, you've, you've worked all across the country, all over the world, really, um, and, and really thinking about unlocking um, economic impact. So, so I'm, I'm excited to, deep, um, to, to dive in and, and discuss that topic. Um, and, and so what we're, how we're gonna structure this is we'll have 15 minutes for an interview Okay, and then we'll open it up to live questions um, with our audience. And so for audience members, please put your questions in the Q&A box, um, or if you're watching on Facebook or Twitter, it will be hashtag night live. All right, so let's do it. Let's get started. Um, so, so Omar, I would love to start with some context setting. Um, if you can tell us a bit about your work with universities and cities and how how do you think about unlocking the impact in these institutions? Like, what does that really mean um, yeah. for our viewers? Um, th thanks, uh, thanks for the introduction, Lily. It's, it's, we, we have a unique perspective because we sit in this uh, in-between space, uh, the space in between institutions, communities, and cities. Mm -hmm. And uh, while people think of us as uh, experts in the real estate market, uh, we uh, sometimes talk about ourselves as urban therapists because at the end of the day, you are trying to really connect the institution to the mm -hmm. community that surrounds it. And in doing so for the benefit of both, to be able to actually create a more sustainable economic development 
uh, strategy that benefits the, both the institution and, uh, and the community. We are, um, uh, as you said, we work uh, in many cities, small and uh, large. Most of our work is in uh, majority minority cities. Uh, so we, uh, we tend, because of our work, uh, deal with the question of equity, question of access, question of uh, uh, social justice as just a part of the fabric of what we have to deal with. These are elite institutions in many cases surrounded by impoverished uh, neighborhoods that have been disinvested in. And then what are the connections that you can make to actually lift everybody up? Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so I, wa I wanna explore two things here. So, so one is, tell me a bit more, let, let's ground it a bit. Tell me a bit more about what that means, connecting a university to a community. Can you give me some examples of, of how that works? So while the, the conventional uh, thinking about institutions uh, is about, you know, we, are, we, we produce um, knowledge, uh, teacher, uh, te teaching uh, students, for um, uh, uh, really entering the, a productive uh, life uh, and solving the world's problems, as well as research, uh, we actually tend to think of institutions as an enterprise. Mm -hmm. And in, that's our kind of theory of change. If, what is the hypothesis that we have carried? It's not a hypothesis, actually, given how much it has been implemented is that these institutions are really enterprises. They produce knowledge, of course, but they own real estate, they uh, procure a lot of goods, they yeah. uh, hire people, they invite students uh, to their campuses, so there is a lot of traffic coming and uh, going, and they are producer of culture, they are producer of content uh, that is of interest to uh, the larger uh, public, and as such, most of, in most cases, that uh, enterprise is uh, diluted in its impact because there is no uh, place-based strategy to it. Mm -hmm. So we bring in a place-based strategy or a lens to the enterprise. And we say something very simple. If we buy more local uh, goods, if we hire more local residents to work at universities and hospitals, if we live closer to those campuses, we, by nature of the buy local, hire local, live local, which mm -hmm. we created about literally in Detroit about now 13 years ago, uh, it's, uh, uh, it actually uh, creates an economic uh, underpinning for that locality that uh, creates more, uh, more uh, uh, sustainable um, economic growth. So that's, that's the theory of how we, we go around it. And, and when you think of it, it's, uh, the, you know, the research is a big part of that. Yeah. The research is actually uh, uh, pushing the boundaries of knowledge and the boundaries of discovery. And if you connect that uh, to entrepreneurship, to commercialization uh, and licensing of, uh, of the discoveries and the like, suddenly you are not just trying to employ everyone in a pie that is the same, same pie, you actually are increasing the pie. Yeah. That's yeah. how we, we think about it. And, and that makes perfect sense. Um, uh, you said buy local, hire local, create local. Um, but, but why, Omar, I work in a lot of, as you know, I work in a lot of university towns. Um, why, why is that sometimes missed? Like something so basic and practical. Why, why is there sometimes a disconnect? It's uh, uh, first. Um, we are blessed because if uh, if it was not missed, we would not have a. <laughs> so let let me just acknowledge that. <laughs> um, I actually would say that it is a very natural product of uh, of higher education. Okay. Uh, and uh, you know you uh, you ended up uh, you know, with the heritage of campuses being this place where you retreat from the hustle and bustle of the cities to actually have very good thoughts and think about whether it's philosophy or it's about science or, or mm -hmm. what have you. So there is actually almost uh, in the DNA of the sector is this sense of seclusion because I, I don't want to get distracted. But then of course, you know, you have uh, as, as institutions grew over time, it became obvious that they are also trying to solve the practical problems that people yeah. 
So then that, uh, that retreat didn't, doesn't work in that uh, sense. But institutions by and large are uh, staffed by folks that are focused on the core mission and there's nothing, there's no problem uh, in that. But there, there is a missed opportunity to making the connections that are much closer to them uh, than they think. You know, institutions will see their peers mm -hmm. as peers in the same, um, uh, you know, four, four year, elite four year college uh, or a, uh, a top 50 Carnegie uh, uh, research institution or the like, but they may actually have more in common with the retail store across the street from campus. Oh, and they have with another institution because the person who owns that retail store is actually physically there. They have a common uh, sense of what's important, what's good, and then so on and so forth. So the, you kind of try to come in and say, you have been looking at it in the right way for the core mission. But now yeah. part of your core mission is to actually uh, extend to the local um, uh, geography around you and make those connections to the people around you because that's how you generate uh, knowledge and generate experience by students that are um, uh, grounded in the realities of what yeah. they do around them. That, that, thank you. That, that's, that's really helpful. So, so I want to I, I wanna move into this moment in time. Um, uh, this is incredibly relevant um, during COVID-19. Um, and and as, as you know, and as our audience knows, um, this has led universities across the countries, uh, across the country, excuse me, to, to shut down um, or to have a hybrid model um, for, for safety precautions. Um, and, and what we know also is that, um, and we talked about this before, is this will likely exasperate a trend of universities potentially permanently shutting their door. Um, and, and I wanna make sure that we link to U3's research and dashboard on the geography of campus closures. Um, so can you talk a bit about um, you know, what you're seeing and learning um, in particular um, during this moment in time of, of, of COVID with respect to universities and cities? So let's, let's take a step back before COVID. Uh, mm -hmm. Higher education has been, I, I, I believe, is in a, in an existential threat. Mm -hmm. of its business model is not working anymore. And that is, again, not because of COVID. You have uh, demographics in the country that are not growing as it has been the case in the past uh, 20 years. In a crude way, there are more seats than warm bodies to, to fill those seats. That's a very crude way of uh, explaining it. And that is not a blip of few years. That is a trend that is, is, is going to stay with us, according to demographers, for 20, 20 some, uh, some years. Uh, so there is that pressure. Then there is the pressure of affordability. We have really been working uh, off a system of, you know, you borrow your way into college, but then with a tremendous sense, uh, tremendous debt, uh, that is just not going to be uh, working anymore. And then online, that uh, online education that really is begging the question of, do I need to have built as much uh, square footage, as much buildings, yeah. uh, and take on in the debt to build those buildings? In a way, COVID exasperated all of that. Mm -hmm. um, we have, uh, uh, you know, in, in many ways, higher education is in need to rethink uh, mm -hmm. its business delivery model. And uh, not all of the institutions will survive. You know, the elite are going to continue to be elite and for every seat there is going to be 10 or 20 applications. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the next year, uh, when, you're, when you are uh, going to spend 60 and $70,000 uh, mm -hmm. and you will not be getting a top uh, uh, degree, there is a question of a value proposition here of, you know, uh, wh why I would do that versus going to a public institution. But even on the public side, where you would think that that will push demand to the public, we yeah. have for now 20 some years across most states, uh, we have been decreasing uh, uh, public funding for our education. That's which right. Yeah. has been a tremendously bad public policy that even the public institutions are not able to take on the growth 
uh, or to be able to actually have a sustainable business model given the pressures they have on, uh, on tuition. So in all of that, you then bring in a pandemic that ac uh, accelerated the online. Uh, interesting, online education has been talked about as a displacer to, of, of uh, current uh, methods of teaching. And uh, in fact, not many have gone there and it has had a marginal effect. But now, you know, most universities are either hybrid or fully online. So that I think will have a sustainable impact uh, moving forward. Um, you have, uh, and, that, and that then begs the question on pricing. Am I still paying $70,000 if uh, many of my courses are online? Right. But then also that begs the question, how much did I build on campus? And uh, do I want to rethink the campus uh, facilities? Because why am I carrying that overhead uh, yeah. in terms of square footage that in fact is not as productive as it used to be because of the online delivery? I still believe tuition is going to be a huge, huge issue. And, uh, and, and, and that, uh, in a way, is uh, going to uh, fundamentally change or force a change in the business model for institutions. But in-, in What do in, you mean by that, Omar? Like what, the tuition piece, like that they're gonna have to lower tuitions because of the, the virtual yeah, piece? Or, so yeah, going to be that pressure. And I actually believe that there is going to be a greater push at a public policy level for free public education at public institutions. Mm. And then institutions that are not public are going to have to work uh, in making the case for a, what is the value proposition if I go to, uh, to University X, uh, I get it for free. I get a four-year uh, diploma for, for free versus going to a private institution that, uh, that I have to, to pay for. Now, institutions that have big endowments are able to subsidize the tuition for many students. But many of the smaller colleges are not really endowment rich, and they are more uh, tuition dependent. And this goes to the question of closure that you raised, uh, Lily. Many of the uh, colleges that are under tremendous, tremendous pressure are the smaller colleges in smaller towns. And those towns are college towns and the uh, larger employer is the college. But those are the colleges that are, um, uh, are, are under uh, the highest pressure. And uh, in, uh, in many ways, uh, it's, uh, if you step back and you take that subsector of higher education, you find that it is the, uh, the type of, of college that teaches uh, more of the first gen and the minority students than any other parts. Even, I am not 100% certain about the numbers, but it may compete even with the publics. Uh, you know, most of the publics, the, the, the minority students are somewhere between you know, 10 to maybe 20, 20 some percent. But uh, many of these institutions, the minority students, first gen women are, are constituting 50 and 60 and 70 percent. Mm. So you have really a, a, a double uh, bad uh, impact, negative impact. Negative impact economically on the town. Uh, the entire economy of that town is largely driven by the, the college activity. And then you have, you are cutting off access to the most vulnerable population, to the ladder that can actually get them into society to be productive and to move, uh, to move up uh, in, uh, in income and health and, and all of the other indicators. So I, I actually, I mean, that's, that's a very a difficult part for me to accept that, uh, you know, we have a system that in fact is going to uh, punish the vulnerable rather mm. than to actually find a way to deal with, uh, to, to mitigate that. Mm. Mm. So there's some really major equity issues too, as we, as we see, um, you know, particular schools that are, that are, are being threatened. Um, and, and I'm starting to look at the questions. Um, and there is a particular question around, um, HBCUs um, and um, and and um, it, it's it's been well documented in the news. Um, you know some of the the financial issues that that they've had across the country too. 
Um, any, any comment about that? I mean, they are part of that uh, most vulnerable uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, cohort of uh, institutions. Uh, and uh, uh, my, my, my sense is that uh, they are kind of uh, the leading indicator of how institutions that are serving um, first gen and minority students are in fact uh, mm -hmm. being under uh, tremendous stress. I, I believe that the answer, uh, Lily, is, is it's right now, mm -hmm. the answer is each institution on its own. Mm -hmm. But the fundamental problem with that construct, I am, a, as an institution, it is very difficult for me to just pull the plug and say, I'm, I'm done. So I mm -hmm. wait and wait and wait and I try my best and I keep changing programs and changing uh, uh, ways to recruit students. But I am still competing for the same limited number of students. Mm. I am competing across the entire country. International students are not coming in as they used to. And, and uh, certain regions, the, dem dem the demographics of certain states are even more uh, pronounced than other states. You know, if yeah. you are in the Midwest, uh, the, there is just the, the cohort going into college is much, much less than uh, it used to uh, in the past. But right now, each institution is left on its own. And in mm -hmm. my opinion, that is an extremely, extremely difficult path because mm -hmm. you are asking a president and its board to either put themselves out of business and kind of land softly to come up with a creative idea of how they can change the business model and survive. And mm -hmm. I believe that the, the answer needs to be at a higher, uh, uh, at a higher level. Either there is a, uh, a federal bailout of higher education that actually looks at uh, higher education as a tremendous investment, not any different than when we started the land grants and uh, institutions back in the days. Uh, that was a way to say, I'll give you land and uh, give you funding and you will create an institution that will produce uh, productive uh, citizenry. I mean, there, there was a, a mm -hmm. time when we actually invested in our people. And uh, so either there is a level of a state or federal intervention. Mm -hmm. uh, intervention by philanthropy or a group of civic uh, leaders in a region or in a city that brings institutions of that uh, that are um, uh, impacted by, by this uh, in a coherent way to actually address it as a group, uh, or uh, it's the individual mergers and acquisitions. Uh, we, mm -hmm. are, we can talk about it as if we are in, the, uh, in other uh, sectors of the economy, but it has to be the case that, uh, you know, public institutions taking over smaller colleges, uh, mm -hmm. large research institutions uh, merging with smaller colleges, and rethinking then what that campus uh, is going to uh, focus on compared to the larger institution. But right now, I would say largely we are leaving institutions to, on their own. Some of them are uh, ha have a longer uh, runway uh, to, figure, uh, uh, to figure this out. Some uh, don't and are tremendously stressed out. Uh, and, or we are starting to see uh, the mergers, you know, here in Philadelphia, Jefferson University uh, merged with the Philadelphia University, a smaller college, uh, and that has been a successful model. So those are the two interventions that we see. But this idea of a statewide uh, look at, at the sector at large, we don't see that. Mm. Uh, you know, just to give people a sense of how big this sector is, we have 4,000 plus colleges. We have oh, uh, about 20 million students that are going into these colleges uh, in all of uh, these years. We have 4 million employees. It's a sector that employs 4 million people across the country. Between investments and expenses, there is about 1.3, 1.4 trillion dollar is the size of that, of that sector. Mm. So if any other sector is failing, we would have said it's too big to fail and we would have intervened. But somehow the fragmentation of higher education and because it is really not in the main narrative of, of uh, people thinking about universities as enterprises, uh, they are left to, their, uh, to themselves. And Interesting, yeah. 
I, I hadn't really thought of that, Omar, and um, and and that's that's so right. Uh, if if I remember correctly, there's been other bailouts, um, <laughs> so I, I'm making a joke. Um, and so you know, I mean, it, other bailouts for other industries. So so I mean, this this really does that that does make sense. Um, and and my my final question was, crisis brings opportunities, and you already you know answered what are some of the opportunities potentially, um, you know, whether it's it's a bailout or or, um, uh, mergers and acquisitions. Um, I think and, there's one yeah. more, Lily, oh, which please. is really repurposing the, many of the campus buildings. Uh, there is, a, you know, a conversation about maybe some of the campuses will uh, uh, integrate vertically mm -hmm. in uh, in uh, uh, secondary and elementary secondary uh, schools that uh, allow for, uh, for a continuum of education. Oh. That's something that uh, working with the Kresge Foundation Detroit has uh, proved to be extremely successful. Uh, there is also rethinking of some of those colleges as an extension of community colleges and that it is not really anymore a four-year degree as much as it is geared towards uh, um, uh, certificates that are much more practical. Uh, for the local uh, for the local economy, but we need to be rethinking some of the physical assets of these institutions rather than just uh, 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 let it uh, slide. Yeah, absolutely. I, I so integrating vertically, extension of community college. I mean, this is this is all really interesting. And 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 you said you're working with Kresge. So so this is already happening, if I understand you correctly. It's a tremendous example in uh, Mary Grove in Detroit, where a college is seeing this. Uh, as, uh, uh, you know, all of these uh, stress points. Uh, you know, was not able to continue as a business. Kresge mm. intervened. Uh, saved uh, the, the the land and the buildings and reimagined the campus as a uh, uh, a uh, uh, the, the beginning of an of a uh, uh, pilot for uh, a P two to twenty an education working with the University of Michigan in partnership with the school district in Detroit. The mm -hmm. school opened last year. A great success story where mm -hmm. the University of Michigan is now invested in the middle of Detroit in a very positive way and reimagining really the Mary Grove campus as a, uh, a different type of an education um, uh, institution. That's great. That's great. That, thanks for that example. Um, so I want to get to uh, elevate a couple other questions that we have, Omar. We're, we're almost at time. Um, so, so there's a question around, um, and, and you've, you've already talked a little bit about this, but, but how much do you think the traditional model of universities where, where students physically come to the campus for years at a time um, will be um, threatened by COVID? Um, so, so tell me what, tell me your thinking around that. Of course, you, you can't predict it, but, but what do you, what are you thinking? And I'm not really sure if COVID, uh, so, so actually there is enough anecdotal evidence mm -hmm. that students uh, are longing to come yeah. to campus and to experience the college experience away from home. So yeah. that I think is, is, uh, there is enough evidence of even in, in the middle of a pandemic, Students are not really saying, I'm staying out. Uh, I, I was talking to a president of one local institution where uh, the deferrals are very minimal uh, in terms of students who didn't want to come and, and, and start. Um, but I think the question is much more about online education and the mm. question is about affordability. Okay. I mean, you would think that uh, you know, if you if you pick if you take a, uh, uh, the cost of education, a big part of it is uh, room and board. And will we find uh, more tendency for people to stay locally rather mm -hmm. than you know applying to ten universities and colleges across the entire country? And that the, the feeding the feeder for each of those colleges and universities are much more regional and local than they have been national and international. But that's a speculation. We don't really know yet if that's going to be the case. But I would say affordability is going to impact that and online uh, education much more than COVID. Got it. Got it. That's and and so it's that business. So you, you you touched on this before, but it's the business delivery model um, is is really going to be disrupted. Um, 
so so just just last question any any examples of of universities and cities that are doing really interesting things during this time um, with COVID? Any, any, any that you want to highlight um, to, to be able to ground the conversation a bit? To be honest with you, most institutions are uh, largely in a, uh, literally in a lockdown kind of uh, mentality. Yeah. We need to survive this pandemic. Um, we need to worry about the students that are coming here. Uh, either we are delivering online education the right way or if they are showing up physically uh, for their safety and health uh, and wellness. So many institutions are really preoccupied. And I yeah. would say till, uh, till the end of this semester, that will be the entire focus of uh, institutions. Uh, so internally. Uh, yeah, coming yeah. out of it, there will be, the disruption is coming probably in the next year and two, rather than in the, uh, in the uh, focal uh, points here of, uh, of the, the pandemic. But some institutions are doing great uh, ideas, uh, small ideas, but important. Um, you know, subsidizing retail rent uh, for retailers that cannot pay the rent. Uh, trying to encourage for our local, um, um, uh, you know, um, merchandise. Uh, we are actually seeing a lot of push on the buy local aspect as a way to responding to uh, to, to to this. But it's uh, it's uh, again uh, we are really focused on the sustainability of this semester before we can think about the long term sustainability. Got it. Okay. Well. Well, Omar, this has been really interesting. Um, thank you for, for joining us on Coast to Coast. Um, it's, it's relevant for so many of our cities across the country. I also want to make sure that we share the dashboard that you three advisors also made, which I thought was fantastic um, for, for geography and, and, and closures um, for cities. And, um, and with that, um, thanks again. And for our audience, we'll see you next Tuesday um, at 1 p.m. Thanks a lot. Thanks Take a care. lot, everyone. Bye-bye.